on these calls. Um, many of my have a chance to talk to in a long time, and it's great to see and be able to talk and interact with people kind of during this time. Um, so yeah, make sure you're asking your chats in the on the side. As I said, you can either leave your um, video on if you want or um, off. It's kind of up to you. Definitely please try to leave your microphone off um, just so we don't have kind of the background noise. And yeah, so today we got Jamie on this one, um, Jamie Bates Stallone, and she is a figurative ceramic artist working in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, so she's going to be giving us a little bit of her current work that she's working on and kind of her current studio space. As I know, she's kind of working from home during all of this. Um, and then she's going to finish with a talk about her work and kind of show you all of, I don't know about all of her work, but a good selection of her work and talk about kind of what is behind everything. So we are super excited to have her on here. How are you doing, Jamie? I'm good. Doing pretty good. Um, keeping busy. <laughs> Great. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know, Jamie is a, an instructor at Oklahoma University State? of Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma, um, which I'm sure has been a difficult time with her from transferring to digital teaching versus kind of being in the classroom. So I'm sure she's trying to figure all of that out as it goes. So I'm going to start out and kind of ask her how this virus has really affected not only her studio practice, but kind of her teaching, because that is a huge part of what she does. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it was really interesting because um, the beginning of all of this stuff, um, it was about, like, the last week we had classes right before spring break, um, and Sika was canceled that week. Um, we had a huge, um, we actually had three visiting artists out that week. We had Randy Johnson, um, uh, Chris Gustin and uh, Matt Long out so it was like we had like this huge party and then all of a sudden like we were all cut off and um, yeah so we were told we were only gonna have to teach online for two weeks so I I relaxed a little bit into this like idea of like oh this will be fine only two weeks you know and then um, yeah and then we had to go fully online which was crazy but um, teaching ceramics online has been interesting um, I I'm pretty happy with how the semester turned out considering. Um, had a lot of my students do um, podcast interviews. Like they, they uh, I made them all listen to Tales of Red Clay Rambler and make their own podcast um, episode with some artists that I, I gave them. So that was a lot of fun to kind of hear them chat with other artists and things like that. But um, that's kind of how I had to adjust my classes. I did a lot of online tutorials um, and that kind of thing. but. You know, students, like I was telling, I was telling um, Travis earlier, like you just find some of them, like they're in their um, closet underneath the stairs trying to do their work or, and things like that. So you're dealing with students that are dealing with life, you know, as we know it now as well. So it's just, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard time for everybody. But um, as far as like studio practice goes, um, I am really good about when things go bad, I just, decide to pile more work on because I like to keep myself busy, which is not a great thing, but um, it's just a coping me mechanism. So um, I've started some sculptures. I'm doing a commission for um, a group in Kansas City. So I'm doing a commission sculpture of um, Tom Pendergast. He was kind of the, the mob boss of Kansas City in the 20s and 30s. So that's kind of a new change of pace for me. Um, then I've been working on a lot of functional stuff. I did a bit of a pre-sale, um, pre-order kind of thing. So that way, like, orders come in and I'm able to just keep myself making um, and doing stuff, which has kind of been useful and helpful. Great. Yeah, I mean, it's such an awkward time. I do think there's a lot of great things coming out of the pan this whole pandemic thing, which is awful to say. Um, the yeah. one thing I know I'm really excited about is kind of this format of things. I mean, you kind of, you know, you get to kind of participate in a lot more things that aren't typically going on. Um, I know these are awesome because it really provides an opportunity to hear you talk about your work to people all over the world, um, which I think is kind of one good thing that will hopefully stick around after this is over with. Um, so I think that's like a really great kind of avenue for things. And I think it, you know, I'm sure 
dealing with trying to teach ceramics through this is really hard, but I think providing yeah. like an opportunity to get on calls to talk to artists is huge. I mean, to be able to, I don't know, I could nerd out all day and talk about how I'd love to sit. I mean, these are great because I get to invite people like you to talk to about people I admire and like really look up to their work. So I think that's great. Um, yeah, it's so been a lot of fun. What are the things you've been dealing with that are really like kind of a struggle? I know like me personally, I mean, we kind of talked a little bit like I'm working from home. I kind of feel like I have, have all this time, but I feel like I'm really like laxed. It's hard to find the time, even though you kind of feel like, you know, you're at home all day, so studio time and kind of balancing like, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of like studio guilt. Like I've had a lot of that myself kind of, you know, not like I have any more time, but kind of that's like, things like that I kind of find a struggle kind of through all of this is there something that you've been having to kind of figure out kind of how you, how are you working around it yeah um well I've always I mean, been like this my whole life but um when I'm left to my own devices like my sleep pattern gets real crazy <laughs> um like today like last night I didn't go to bed until almost 5 a.m woke up at 2 p.m like I am like on a completely different schedule than everyone else um, and I've always been that way. I think even my mom said like as a baby, I would wake up at like 10 a.m. Like not, I was not normal <laughs> um, or what normal would be considered to be. But um, that's been a struggle, just kind of like trying to find like a, a pattern or um, a routine in my daily life. Um, but I've been able to kind of figure that out. Um, like if I'm doing schoolwork, I don't do it in my studio. I do it in my office upstairs. So it feels like I'm going to the office or something like that. Keeping that separation even within my home, which I'm super lucky to have that because not everybody has an office and a studio space. Um, we just have like a weird little loft space in our house that is our office now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's like, it's like just trying to like, um compartmentalize your your life in one space is kind of difficult but um we've been gardening a lot because that's something to kind of keep my mind off of working all the time because now for some reason i just want to work all the time because i can there's no there's no social life like i don't have to go hang out with anybody on a friday night i don't have to go to an opening i don't have to go to this thing so um what Unfortunately, what I tend to do is like, okay, that's more work time. Awesome. But it's, I think it's not great. You have to kind of let yourself take a break and have some balance occasionally. You're just going to go crazy. Yeah. Well, you are hanging out with us tonight, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> this is your social time tonight, which is awesome. It's great. Um, yeah. I've been doing a lot of this stuff. Like I, I went to a Zoom happy, like a birthday party the other day and I didn't think anything of it. Um, I was like, oh, I'll just be there for a few hours, but I ended up drinking for five hours on a Zoom happy, <laughs> like a birthday party, so. <laughs> yeah, which is, I mean, things like that are huge. So just even these, just getting to see people's faces as you're talking is like a huge, I don't know, it makes me really happy when I especially like to see all of these people coming, you know, mm -hmm. even though it's not really quite the same, but kind of being stuck in your house really is. I mean, I'm pretty good at being by myself, but this is a little a whole different kind of extent. Yeah, thing, yeah so. exactly. I'm technically, you could consider me an introvert, but um, I need I need little bursts of of socializing to get my, you know, like not having in Sika. Um, I actually was talking to April Felipe about this, and and I was like, not to sound, you know, um, conceited or shallow in any kind of way, but that was like my ego boost for the year was going to Ensika and seeing people in person and like feeling that like, I don't know, the rush from the community and things like that. Um, so without that, like, it just, it's like, okay, I don't know, life moves on. I still have dreams about like missing things at Ensika. It's weird. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> Ensika is like a recharge for everybody. If you don't know, Ensika is like the national ceramics conference that happens every year. Um, it's, I mean, it's great. It really is. I love that it's kind of like a ego boost, which is, I don't, you know, it's kind of like an energy recharge. Um, mm -hmm. it really like you get to see so much work and I think being able to be in that environment really helps get everyone excited for the year. Cause it's kind of, you know, especially you live in kind of rural Oklahoma, um, yeah. you know, so it's great to kind of get outside of that. Um, which is, I really wish to see it happen, but 
next year. I, I at first it'll I be, was a little it'll relieved be because I felt like I needed a break when all of this happened, to be really honest. Like I felt like it was probably an okay time to take a break. But now that it's like all passed and those dates pass, like workshops like pass and I was like I was gonna be in San Francisco last weekend and all this stuff and Enseco was gonna happen and um, like in a few weeks, I was going to go to Aramont and it's like all those things start to pass and you start to kind of grieve a little bit. You're like, oh, like I would be there right now doing this thing. But the nice thing is knowing that most of it's rescheduled for next year or postponed or, you know, having a little hope keeps you sane, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I think having that community is such a big part of, you know, it's pretty easy to be like a studio person, but it's like having those short like bits in that like really compact community is huge um mm -hmm. i mean for like touchstone we canceled all of our classes that is like my favorite time of year it's when i get to be around everybody and i think you know even a lot of the artists miss out you know it's not like they miss out on all of their like kind of social time in a way which yeah. is you know different you know you get to see and see because like you get to see all your friends that you don't get to see it's been kind of like a hard thing thing for a lot of people to really kind of adjust to but um yeah before we could we could talk all day about this i'm sure but uh yeah yeah you want to <laughs> kind of show people kind of what you're working in your sure. studio space i know we already talked a little bit about your differences and kind of you, you you have another studio space that you work out of but kind of your limitations of where you are now yeah um so i'm gonna flip the camera around real quick um Sorry, everyone. I'm I'm using my phone because our there's storms here right now and the internet's not working very well. Um, luckily, I was I was actually a little worried that I might have to do this from my storm shelter, <laughs> but it looks like it's not so bad. Um, so to start, um, I'm just gonna give give you all a little tour of the studio. Let me flip this around. Um, Bernie found something to tear up, so give me a <laughs> It's a it's a it's a hood that or it's it's a Halloween costume that my husband uses to scare him and now he's like tearing apart. Okay, anyway, um, one second, guys. I'm gonna actually get my husband to take him because he's being really awful. Come on. <laughs> hey, Matt, can you call him? Go, bud. All right, I'm gonna close the door. Sorry, everyone. All right. <laughs> so, um. Yeah, so since this uh, pandemic has started, I basically stopped everything that I was doing in my studio at school, which is mostly larger work. Um, um, I usually do it all there just because I have the um, space to work that large. So this is probably as big I'm gonna, as I'm gonna get while I'm working from home. Um, but um, this piece hasn't been hollowed out yet. But I'll be working on that fairly soon. I've got some other things I have to finish up. That's the one nice thing about working solid is like I can keep it wrapped up for a while after um, I've built it and then decide to attack hauling it out later. Um, so I've been doing a lot of, I've been working on that piece. And then um, I have like just some demonstrations that I've been doing for my classes. I teach a figure class at OU and um, so I've had to do, <laughs> do all of my demonstrations online, which has been fun. Um, but I've been making a lot of jewelry and functional work. So a few of these things are gonna be sent off to the Bray for their um, cup auction for um, what would be the Bray Bash, but they unfortunately had to cancel it. Um, then I have, you know, jewelry, jewelry that's in the works for um, some of my pre-order commissions. Um, I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but this is a special gift for somebody. <laughs> they don't know they're getting it, so I'm really excited to send it off. Um, and then um, this is the commission actually I've been working on for the Tom Pendergast commission. So this is just a, a maquette. So it's all cracks and falling apart because I've had to re-sculpt it about six different times to get them to finally settle on a design. Um, but I think this is the one that they're going to have me do. I'm really excited about this because being from the Kansas City area, I finally get to like, you know, do something for the city, which is really exciting. Um, and if you're interested in figuring out who Tom Pendergast is, I would recommend looking him up. He's a pretty, pretty interesting dude. So, um, oh, hang on. Am I supposed to see this? Okay. 
Uh, yeah, my, so my figure students do have access to clay. Um, so they've been able to like get into the buildings um, to get like bags of clay occasionally. They have to like go in like one at a time. <laughs> um, so they've been able to get, get materials if they're still in town. But a lot of students actually um, live outside of Norman. So um, some students had to go back home to like Washington or Texas or wherever they're from. And, um, so that's been a challenge trying to like get them resources wherever they are. Um, yeah. So yeah, and then I've again working on some more of these like commission pieces or not commission pieces, but um, pre-order pieces. So these are those um, planters or bowls that I'm pre-selling. So I've been sculpting mouths like a crazy person, cups. Um, but yeah, and then so like I keep my space kind of at least try to keep red clay or any kind of like stoneware over on this side. And then this is where I typically work with like porcelain um, on like my jewelry and functional wear. So here's some stuff that's been bisqued um, recently. Just pulled it out of the kiln. But yeah, I think that's it. Do you guys have any like questions about like my studio other than like oh, all this dog stuff everywhere? <laughs> I mean, I definitely have some questions I can talk about all yes, day about. Yes. Um, I mean, you, I know you work from two studio spaces and like you're mm -hmm. kind of confined to this one right now. You, I mean, you typically make some pretty large pieces. I mean, you have the feet going. Um, do you find it like pretty limited with what you can do in this kind of space all the time? Or is it, you know, do you feel like you can kind of, do you have a kiln there? I mean, also? Um, you know? I don't. I mean, I do and I don't. So I have, I did bring my kiln home from school. I have a, a small kiln that um, I keep there for like firing stuff in my office. It's, um, it just plugs into a regular like 20, um, like a 20 amp or 20 volt um, plug. So it's, yeah, I have a little kiln um, here that I can fire, but I obviously not big enough for that piece. So um, I think we're allowed to go back on campus after the 20th if our research um, requires us to use um, the facilities, which in my case um, applies. So we have to be tested and go through a few things before we can go back on campus. But um, luckily in the near future, I'll be allowed to do that. Thank goodness. But mm -hmm. yeah, so we haven't had access to our studio since, um, before spring break, so that was March. So that was probably about two months ago today. Yeah. Before all of this hit, did you find you spent more time working in this space or did you find more, were you working at school a lot more in that studio space you have? I think I find myself working in this space more often because it's like, it's at home, obviously. Um, and when I'm working in my space at school, um, I have, I'm a pretty relaxed professor and I'm very open and students, bug me all the time like even if my door shut they still knock <laughs> so um i can't I, I don't really get a whole lot done there unless like i shut my door like put a note on the door like leave me alone <laughs> i'm here to work i'm not here to answer your questions um but yeah so it's difficult to get a lot of work done at, at um at my studio at school so it's been kind of nice um to be able to focus and um get work done here yeah, I imagine it's always hard to get work done at your place of work. Um, mm -hmm. kind of that, I think that's kind of a struggle with probably a lot of professors that have kind of that situation is kind of finding those boundaries of mm -hmm. your own personal time versus, you know, teaching time, which I think most ceramics or most artists in general are really open people. So, you know, you always want to help people as much as you can. Um, yeah. But it's and also, it's like automatically in my nature, I, I need to be needed. So if a student needs something, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Like, what is it? Like, I'm, I'm fulfilling my own like needs at the same time, but um, I can't focus long enough to get any work done. Or if I could hear someone having like an interesting conversation out in the main studio, because my studio is right off the main studio. So if I hear something, I'm like, oh, hey. And then I get stuck in a, an hour long conversation. And I don't get anything done. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, a home studio is kind of a whole different realm. Like I've, I mean, I've just moved into the kind of home studio within the past few years and it kind of changed my life. I mean, there's something about having that community around, which is so good, but it also is kind of really nice to have your own space really to not have the distractions and kind of how mm -hmm. that 
not necessarily how it like influences your work you just kind of like what you make and it takes a lot of brain space to make artwork sometimes and kind of the constant distraction can be kind of a lot to kind of deal with so um i definitely understand that fully mm -hmm. um i mean you make a do you find like right now you're making a lot of the smaller work are you making kind of are you you know what is your time kind of divided between so lately it's been all functional stuff um because i've mostly just had um commission or not commission but the uh pre-orders to deal with so um i think like when i when i did i don't know if anybody saw what i um did it was probably like the beginning of april um i kind of went into panic mode because of all the workshops being canceled and everything um i <laughs> decided to do this pre-order sale and um to make up for all that income that was going to be lost and it made up for more more income than than what was lost but now i have all of this work to do it's like basically i gave myself all the busy work to do so i don't have any excuse to not be in the studio i i often do this i'll set myself up to make sure that i'm working like i've learned how to trick myself over over the years yeah I think that's a great way to stay motivated i do that <laughs> like I, you just set yourself up for like layover of what you can actually handle and it keeps you working this is very easy to like not make work um we do have a question about kind of your process of yeah. if you want to kind of talk a little bit about that and then we'll jump right into your slide talk. cool so um so we got a question about kind of like how i mean it's about hollowing out your work because you said your feet that you're working on is solid um so mm -hmm. do you want to talk a little bit about kind of the sculpting and hollow the whole process of kind of starting to finish kind of how absolutely you yeah um that's why i had it out because i was gonna kind of i wanted to chat a little bit about how i might address hollowing it out because that's like usually the biggest mystery because it's the most boring thing to watch so it's not something i demo right um because like do you want to sit there and watch me hollow out a five pound section of clay no <laughs> so um with this piece uh the way i addressed it so there are actually internal structures um that are going straight up on the inside so there are two more pipe armatures that are um supporting the inside but as i was building it things were this piece actually got a lot bigger than i intended so things started sagging a little bit. So I had to add this extra brace. Um, it's not the most graceful addition, but it works. Um, it's not gonna get in the way too bad when it's, once I start hollowing. Um, so if I, if I were to hollow this right now, um, I'm probably gonna end up actually cutting the feet apart um, and then actually putting them to back together um, post firing. This probably is gonna be one of the pieces I actually end up finishing with house paints rather than um, underglazes. I kind of flip flop between the two depending on what I'm doing. Um, I don't know why I keep putting underglazes on things. There's just like this ceramic purist in me that still wants to have some sort of ceramic material on the sculpture. Don't know why it's necessary, but in my brain, like it just makes me happy. It satisfies that, that need. Um, but with this, I'm probably gonna have to cut off each individual toe starting like halfway through the toe and just work my way up. So um, when I cut things apart, or actually I probably have to work my way down, I try not to cut everything into a million pieces and then I have a million pieces all over the, the studio. I work my way through the piece. So um, I'll probably make a cut right around here just to kind of cut out or hollow out this kind of um, portion here. Um, I'll probably make another cut right about there below the heel. I try to avoid any areas that have a lot of detail. Um, and I'm also not going to get too terribly detailed before I hollow things because I'll probably just mess up all of the work that I did detailing while hollowing. Um, I'm not a very careful hollower. So I like to kind of keep it rough and then I'll probably um, clean it up a little bit later. Um, and then I'll cut it here, and then I'll cut another here, and then um, again, like I said, I'll probably cut the toes off individually and hollow out that whole like kind of toe and pad section on its own. Um, but yeah, so these things can kind of be difficult, but if you have a plan before you just start hacking at it, <laughs> um, and I always tell people, like never, like the reason why I cut horizontally is that when these things go back together, gravity is gonna work in your favor and it's all gonna kind of 
um, sandwich together back together the way it's supposed to. So if I were to cut this vertically and then fire it, what's going to happen is that piece is just going to split like that um, because gravity is just going to want to pull it apart. Um, but if you stack it all together, kind of like if you were stacking cylinders on top of each other, um, you're likely to get a much stronger piece. And I will try to fire it like this in the kiln. Um, what I will do is probably create, I'll probably just use bricks to like in place of my um, wooden armature here. Um, and then I will create uh, a shrink slab, which if, you, if you're familiar with like some of my um, bigger work, you'll, you've probably seen me use shrink slabs. I'll probably create a shrink slab that will support the foot inside the kiln. So it'll be fired like this as well. Um, just that way, um, if it does warp or anything in the kiln, um, the gesture isn't lost or anything like that. I want it to kind of remain the way it is. I went on a really long tangent, but <laughs> I, I mean, I love hearing about how people work. Um, I think, I mean, I know a lot of people on this chat aren't even ceramics people, so hopefully they find kind of this informative. I know it's a really, it's a very quick breakdown of what she's actually doing. Um, but I think it's great to come here in that process. Um, well, I have one question before you start. Um, so before you jump into something this big, do you like work out an armature or something for it first? Um, yeah, so like with this one, it's not terribly big, but with like some of like the three quarters life size work I've done before, um, that all starts with like um, probably either a maquette or I'll take images of myself or um, like I, I had like a four foot tall foot that I made last summer um, and that all started with my husband taking images from all angles of my foot which was really gross to have like I had like a giant poster of my foot in my studio because I always make these posters I'm basically using all of Beth's, Beth Kavanagh's techniques because she taught me a lot of what I do now um, so I create like a really large um, poster that's to scale at the same size of the, the piece I'm creating. So I had like a four foot photograph of my foot in my studio for like two months. <laughs> um, but I'm able to go from that directly to the piece to, you know, figure out proportion and scale and things like that. Um, but with that poster, I'm also able, I, I put like um, packing tape over it. So I'm able to draw on it and try to figure out where my armatures are going to go. Um, and that also helps when I start cutting things apart. I know where my armatures are within the piece. Does that make sense? Yeah, so like that's I, awesome. I've never. Yeah. So this giant poster works like as a map, basically, um, um, to figure out where things go and where things uh, need to be. And, and, it, and it also keeps me on track as far as scale, because sometimes things always end up larger than I intend them to be. So it kind of keeps like reins me in um, and keeps me on track. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I've never, I love the idea of just putting tape over it because I feel like a lot of people, like, I mean, I see Kevin chilling in here who also uses a lot of pictures and way too many photos. Um, I think putting the tape over, it's like the most ingenious idea that I've never thought of. It's illuminating it so you're able to draw on it. Like, and sometimes, like, if I can't figure out, like, this, the um, silhouette or, I don't know, like you can go off the silhouette of the photograph to kind of figure out the shape and things of what you need to do. Um, but yeah, being able to draw on it, like I can like, oh, I need five wrinkles. I can count like how many wrinkles I need um, on that heel or something like that. So it's a really nice thing to do to like blow up that imagery and have it as big as you need it to be um, in order to create the piece. Yeah. That's great. Um, I don't know about the rest of everybody, but I'm definitely ready to kind of see the rest of your work and hear you actually talk about it. So, okay. cool. Uh, one second. I'm going to flip this around. That, sorry, my husband is like making weird noises to my cat and dog. <laughs> All right. Let's see, screen. Yeah, I love, I love seeing people and how they make their work. Um, I mean, we both kind of work in the same vein, but it's so much different. And I think that is super fascinating just to like hear the little things that people do that are different. Um, I mean, you could, I mean, clay is a wonderful medium. I'm sure kind of every medium's got their own little things, but it's great to just kind of see the little differences and different tricks that people kind of learn throughout the, their yeah. practice. I so. mean, the way I work now is 
um, like a hundred times different. Oh, what's this doing? Okay, there we go. <laughs> we Can do you guys see my notes or is it just we, the PowerPoint? We see your notes. Okay. Well, I'm just going to talk and you're not going to get to, I'm not going to do my notes. We're just going to wing it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to kind of talk about like where my work has, like where it began kind of with what, what I'm doing now and where it's going. Hang on, I'm kicking my dog out of the studio. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'd like to start with this image. It's not like these pieces aren't particularly successful in any kind of way, um, but they kind of started what my work is about now. Um, so this work was done my, I think it was my second year of grad school. Um, I uh, layered this like really nasty green mottled glaze onto this piece. And like, this is the one of my number one, like my go-to glazes for casting and things like that. It's called Lana Chartreuse. Um, it's been around for a long time. Um, if, if any of you have ever been into like low fire, chunky, crazy glazes, this is one of those. Um, but what happened in this firing with these two pieces that I put this glaze on so entirely thick that it like ran all over the place. Um, and I was smart enough to put sand underneath these pieces, but um, and it, like when the glaze hit the sand, like it just stuck. It was just like this cookie. And um, I don't know, for some reason, like that got me thinking about what I could do because the glaze still looked really interesting when it was like in the sand. Um, so I was like, maybe this could be a product of its own. Um, so after that happened, um, I started playing with this idea of casting glazes. So this was the first um, successful attempt at um, this casting method that can't kind of came from that glaze accident in grad school. Um, so I kind of um, dug back into some other exper or experience that I've had in like metal casting and glass casting and things like that. Um, and thought, well, if I make a mold of my hand out of plaster bandage, um, and I simply just wiggle my hand out of that mold um, and fill it with this glaze, will it stand up? So I found a couple of glazes that that works with. I only use two glazes when I'm casting, but I changed the colorants and that's how I have so much variety, um, which is a lot of fun. So um, this is some more work that came from that that time where I was, casting with glazes, I would create these small little specimen type heads and uh, basically um, they would change and morph over time because I would take multiple molds of each piece and so they would start to kind of um, become their own like little characters. These little heads were probably about three inches long. Um, so they were really small. Um, so I called them specimen. Um, they were part of my thesis exhibition in 2012. Um, so as I like started creating these pieces, um, I started taking macro imagery of the surfaces and I was like, ooh, like this looks a lot like um, diseased like imagery, like uh, scanning electron micrographs of, um, of cancer cancerous tissue or other diseases and things like that. I was like starting to see kind of like this um, connection between the two, which is at the time, um, a lot of my work is about mental health, but at the time um, my work was mostly about my family's history with cancer. So it was a little bit more on the physical side, still dealing with like what it, how it all affected me mentally, but not directly talking about me. Um, so I'm looking at these images of cancerous tissues, looking at like the macro images I took of these things and I was like, what can I do with this? I was like thinking, can I, um, print these images or anything like that. And then um, at the same time, I was working on this large, my first like life-sized um, coil build at the time. This is how I used to, to construct most things. Um, I was working on my first life-sized coil built figure. It was really ambitious. I hadn't done it before, but I really wanted to. It was something I felt I needed to do. Um, Although I was really interested in this, like the the experimental side of ceramics, there was still something I was really drawn to about creating the figure with clay. Um, so I felt like these two um, bodies were really separate. Um, but how I draw, like, drew all that together was I decided to take those macro images and project them onto that large scale figure. Um, this is a panoramic view of my thesis exhibition um, in 2012. 
So um, these specimen here, I um, supplied small mic or magnifying glasses um, with each of these little heads so everybody could examine these pieces, kind of like if you were being examined um, um, at a doctor's office or if you um, were examining something in a sci or scientific laboratory. Um, I had these kind of specimens sprawled out on these three tables kind of representing the um, past, present, and future. Um, and I wanted to keep them really simple, stark white, um, very sterile. Um, I also, I also, um, with this piece, uh, this is a, a close-up version of image of um, bio from my, my um, MFA thesis in 2012. So um, this is uh, the piece with the projected imagery on it. So after I finished grad school, um, I moved to Truman, or I moved to um, Kirksville, Missouri to teach at Truman State University for a year. Um, and my husband and I had just gotten married. So I started creating this work that was a little bit more about like me projecting my own anxieties onto my husband now. Um, we're connected for life. We, um, he's oftentimes the only thing that's a like, constant in my life. So um, the thought of potentially losing him and to you know anything like whether it be cancer or an accident or anything like that kind of threw me through a loop when I started thinking about that a little bit more so um this piece was kind of like that idea um I didn't keep the projection limited to the figures itself for this piece um it was kind of nice because the exhibition for this particular piece was um in a perfect like white cube right so I was able to project onto the walls and it was kind of nice because that projection ended up becoming um, something that, like it was almost as if my anxieties and worries were then projected onto the viewer as well. And there's some detail images of that. My husband hated this one, by the way, um, did not like how I sculpt him. <laughs> um, here's the, the, that phenotype series again. Um, once I finished teaching at Truman State, I started a residency at Red Star Studios in Kansas City. Um, and there I did a lot more um, experimentation and exploring with what I could do with that glaze casting process. So I was able to um, kind of implement other colorants. I learned that mason stains don't work as well as um, um, colorants like, you know, oxides and things like that. So um, I was able to kind of create these like really interesting surfaces. And the, what I really love about the glazes that I use is they interact really interestingly well, like together. Um, one of the glazes I use is Landis Chartreuse. The original recipe calls for chrome, um, but it's beautiful with all kinds of other colorants and different combinations. Um, and then I use another glaze that's like, that I found it was called BM3 and it's like a very barium heavy glaze. Um, the really interesting thing too about these pieces is that I'm using glazes with tons of barium, tons of lithium. I'm very careful when I'm using them, but it's really interesting because I'm talking about disease and passing that down from one generation to another. Um, like I didn't um, explain what the, the term phenotype means, but it's basically taking all of your genetic traits and the environmental traits, and it's those things that make up who you are, or it makes up what that um, specific thing might be. Um, but um, so like the idea of this phenotype in the hand is kind of passing these diseases or um, in my case, I'm thinking a lot more about like mental illness down from one generation to another. So there's a close up version of these phenotypes. Um, a little bit of a process, or process images of how I do this. Um, every single one of these hands are made from a cast of my own hand. So I'm not casting um, a previously made anything. I've made, I, like there's been days where like I've made eight different molds and then by the end of the day, you'll see, you'll start to see the pruning on the tips of my fingers that actually end up in the piece. Um, so it's kind of cool how you can kind of see like how things kind of work. Um, I've also learned that you can't make too many, too many of these molds in one day because you'll end up with hickeys on your knuckles. <laughs> so um, again, like I pull, I pull my hand out of the mold um, and then I fill it uh, with the glaze, kind of, kind of as if you were filling um, a mold 
when you are slip casting. So it creates like a nice thin layer um, of glaze on the inside of the mold. And then I put it into this like kind of sand filled crucible, um, which holds it all together during the firing. Again, I use only low fire glazes for this process. Um, I recently was given um, some celadon glazes from Amico to try to try to play with those and see what they can do. Because um, I know that Stephen Creech has tried doing some interesting things with them and he said that he's gotten some cool results. So that's something I'm going to be um, playing with a little bit this summer as well. Um, and then this is how it's all fired. So it's fired in the crucible and everything. So I always have to make like um, like a new cru a new set of crucibles about every year. Um, so they start to break down and start to crack as you fire them so many times. Um, but once everything is fired, I pull it out of the kiln and um, the mold is simply just uh, broken off because all the, the chemical water is burnt out of the plaster. So it's no longer strong um, and it just crumbles right off, especially if you spray a little water on it, it'll pop right off. So again, I've been playing a lot with like, oh, what more can I do with these specimen um, and this glaze casting? So I started playing with ideas of like creating specimen jars and filling these things with um, uh, vegetable glycerin was actually the secret ingredient, the, the final product that actually worked really well for this, this, uh, this piece. Um, at this time, I kind of wanted to find new ways to create this projection work. Um, it was really, at this time, I was trying to apply to exhibitions, and it was really difficult to get um, large-scale work that requires four projectors um, <laughs> embedded into the ceiling into, like, these kind of exhibitions I was applying for. So um, I tried to shrink that scale down and make it a little bit more accessible um, as far as, like, shipping and things like that that go. So this was one of my attempts at doing something like that. Um, but at this time, I was starting to feel like the uh, projection was becoming a bit of a crutch. Um, again, I was a resident at Red Star at this time. So I started kind of focusing on like what I could do to the surface of the clay um, with glazes and slips and things to create uh, um, kind of like a surface that is a reflection of what's happening inside of the body. Um, with this particular, these pieces, um, again, I'm playing with like what you can do and what you, how you can push what you do with glazes. So these particular pieces had little pockets built into the faces um, and they were filled with a foaming glaze that I kicked up a few notches with some, by adding some silicon carbide. Um, so it almost like, uh, it creates this like um, this foam that just squeezes out of these pieces. Um, so it was really organic and, um, and it was really interesting to see um, how these things turned out after they were in the kiln. It was just a really matter of luck and chance to make sure that they were turning out just right. Um, I also had to play with figuring out like what temperature to fire these things to because if you're firing these foaming glazes too hot, they deflate a little bit. So I had to figure out those things um, uh, while I was at it too. Um, here's a, a, an attempt to kind of merge those, the glaze casted pieces with um, sculpted work. So I created like the sculpture on top, um, took a mold of it, created the, um, the mold and um, all the glaze casting stuff for that large or for the smaller piece on the bottom. Um, and then um, carved out all the holes, filled them all with the glaze. So this process, this piece um, took a lot of work, but um, it's not my favorite piece, but it's, it's gotten a lot of good feedback and um, it's something I really wanna try to consider addressing in the future. I'm always trying to figure out new ways to kind of bridge the gap between my glaze casted work and my sculptural work. Um, here, this is kind of the, um, the uh, precipice of, of the glaze cast, or the, the oozing, my oozing glaze phase, basically. Um, this piece was a technical struggle um, in more ways than one. Um, obviously, sculpting it was a lot of fun because I would had to, it's just like free, you know, there's no bottom to it. So I had to do a lot of um, engineering to get that figured out. Um, but all I did to create this like oozing that came from the backside was support it, um, support her head and support her backside to allow the piece to be elevated in the kiln and allow that glaze to ooze down and, it luckily hit the surface of the shelf enough to become what supports the piece in the end. 
so moving on from that, I feel like uh, that, that oozing glaze, it was kind of like, okay, I did it. That's exciting. But I just, again, it was feeling kind of like a gimmick or like a crutch or like I, I felt like I was going to be doing that forever and I wasn't interested in doing it for any longer than I did. So um, I started looking a little bit more at imagery of um, scans again and x-rays and things like that. These are all colorized. Obviously, this isn't like a natural thing, but um, uh, when these images are colorized, certain things have different um, uh, colors attributed to different things. So uh, when I was finishing up my residency at Red Star Studios, that's when this kind of body of work came out. Um, I started creating these figures with, that were more brightly colored um, that kind of reminded me of that imagery I was seeing in those scans. Um, but then I started using the foaming glaze in a more subdued way. So I was um, creating these kind of patches um, or clusters that kind of represented the type of um, cancer that these figures were um, initially affected with. Um, a lot of, or all of these figures are affected with cancers that have been, um, have affected family, um, my family. So, um, mutate would be a liver cancer, separate was lympho, or lymph <laughs> uh, lymphoma, God, getting mixed up, and then swell was, um, ovarian cancer. So, there were two others that were part of this, um, series as well, but they, haven't been strong enough to continue to make it into the slideshow. <laughs> um, so a lot of people always ask me why my work has um, all of the line work that it has on it. So I oftentimes after I finish a piece, I'll go back and draw um, in like more mapping lines or things like that. Um, in the beginning, it was more of an aesthetic choice um, or maybe even a little bit of a way to kind of fool you into thinking that I was getting the proportions right on the figure. Um, but the more I thought about it and the more I actually did some more research into it, I realized that this mapping or this uh, mark making or line making is really um, uh, similar to the kind of um, mapping lines and laser lines they use on you while you're being scanned for CAT scan, PET scans, and things like that. Um, another, I, when I was at Red Star Studios, I had a tendency to work in series because I was surrounded by potters. So it made me like think smaller and made me want to work faster. And at this time I had so many ideas. So I just wanted to work, work, work through all these ideas. So I didn't make anything huge. All of these pieces are kind of, um, I think these pieces are in the realm of like two feet wide, two and a half feet wide by two feet tall. So they're not, not massive or maybe around like 18 inches tall. Um, so here's another um, piece that is also part of that series. So this um, series of these pieces that are kind of connected together, um, the idea was to kind of uh, create pieces that worked as if they were like a splitting cell or, a, um, or like a cancer cell replicating itself. So this is kind of like them in that split and then they were going to only continue to um, replicate themselves. So, um, trying to get through this quickly because I'm realizing this was like five years ago. Um, <laughs> so in 2015, I um, found myself in a weird situation where I got invited to come to go to Studio 740 in Helena, Montana. Um, it was a great opportunity to go work next to um, Beth Kavanagh and Alessandro Gallo. Um, but at the same time, it was a very big move moving from Kansas City and then moving to, or moving to Montana. And then um, I didn't have any kind of income set up. I was gonna bartend. And um, so this was my opportunity to take some time off from teaching um, and focus on my work. So uh, I did a fundraiser, um, like an Indiegogo campaign to, um, to help fund that move and my studio while I was there. And um, these, um, chubby tiles were kind of the answer to that. So I was really interested in the way the body folds and the way the um, skin folds. And so I started playing with that hyper, really bright color, um, but also just kind of playing with just, just the folds of the skin. So <clears throat> the pieces that are up, the pieces that are up here on the right, um, the chubby elbow and the chubby knee, um, the chubby elbow is actually um, based off of Kim Kardashian's elbow. I typed in like Google chubby knee and that's 
or chubby elbow. And that's the first thing that popped up was Kim Kardashian's elbow when she was pregnant. So I just had to do it. Um, and then there was like a chubby baby knee, but those two were like my like biggest sellers. <laughs> Um, as I was at 740, I started to try to think up a little bit more about um, those scanning images and um, x-ray images and things like that, and how I can actually literally recreate that surface on the surface of my sculptures. So I created this scan series. Um, again, I'm still working in series because I wasn't able to kind of like, I don't know if it's just ADD or what, but um, I just could not focus on one large sculpture at the time. So I was kind of like working um, with smaller pieces. So these pieces were that, that answer to that question of, can I create a literal depiction of um, what you're seeing in those scans on the surface of a piece? Um, I really enjoyed these surfaces, but I just don't think that we're, they were working on pieces that large. Um, so originally I created these kind of test tiles, which I call these titty tiles. Um, and they were kind of like the beginning of that. Um, I was really excited about what I saw in these, but for some reason, whenever I put them on a larger sculpture, it just wasn't trans translating. So I kind of abandoned that surface um, after those pieces and a few other smaller pieces, because it just wasn't working for me anymore. Um, but these um, particular tiles, um, I did a small run of them and sold them. Um, and giving 50% of the proceeds to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. So it was at least my way of kind of giving back and not just making work about cancer, but doing something about it. Um, so that was a really nice um, outcome from this kind of series. But um, again, like these surfaces just weren't really working. Um, so I tried to make them a little bit more subdued, um, trying to work more monochromatically. Um, and I'm also tr trying to finally address my fears of working with the full figure again and incorporating full limbs and feet and hands and things like that. Cause like sometimes like I take a break from, from doing full figures because like they just can be exhausting. Um, these pieces are fairly small, um, but I started thinking about like uh, my own mental health and my own physical health a little bit more, not just relation to cancer, but just kind of aging and um, at this time, when we first moved to Montana, I realized like I had um, like big change is a really big trigger for me. So my anxiety like went through the roof and my depression started getting really bad at this time. So this was kind of the start of me trying to address <coughs> uh, those sort of things within my work. Um, so I feel like that's a good stopping point for like older work. Um, so I'm going to kind of try to talk a little bit about like what I've been reading um, there are some new things I want to add to this because um, there are some new books and podcasts that I've been listening to actually during quarantine that I found really helpful. Um, but uh, The Emperor of All Maladies is a really interesting book. Um, I've listened to it at least four times, read it once because it's, it's a very long book, but listened to it about four times. Um, it's basically a history of cancer and kind of how, um, uh, you know, uh, cultures from way back when have dealt with it. There's a really interesting um, passage where they find, um, they talk about finding an Egyptian mummy, a female that had a large, like hard, rock hard mass on her chest and they discovered that it was actually a tumor. Um, so they were discovering that people were dying from cancer even back then um, because a lot of like for a long time it was thought that because we're living longer than we're more affected by cancer. Um, so it's a really interesting book. Um, if you if you like to know about medic, if you love medical history like I do, which is a weird thing, um, I really recommend reading that. It's a really good one. Um, uh, the Noonday Demon, um, the Atlas of Depression, or an Atlas of Depression, is a really great book. It's kind of like um, it works in the same sense as the Emperor of All Maladies. It's kind of a history um, of how we've dealt with it, uh, depression as a society, um, and it also kind of falls back a little bit on the author's own dealings with depression as well. Um, and When Breath Becomes Air is a really beautiful um, memoir that's been, that was written by um, a doctor that was di or diagnosed with cancer um, and he was also working with cancer patients as well. So he was kind of experiencing this strange, um, I don't know, parallel between the two of being the, both the patient and the doctor. Um, 
the really heartbreaking thing about that book is that it actually ends with his uh, late or his uh, widow finishing the last chapter because he died before he was able to finish it. Um, and then um, autobiography, autobiography of a face um, by Lisa Greeley. Um, that is one of my favorite books of all time because it's not only talking about cancer, but it's also talking about her um, her dealings with it and how it affected her mentally and emotionally. Um, and how she was able to kind of overcome um, and how she dealt with a lot of those things. One of my favorite quotes from any book ever, um, hopefully I don't butcher it, don't have my notes to see it right now. Um, <clears throat> but um, she says in the book that um, some things can happen in your life um, and you will live the rest of your life in reference to them. So um, it's kind of talking about like trauma and things like that and how they're going to stick with you like glue for the rest of your life and you have to kind of adjust um, how you live in reference to those. Um, a few podcasts that I listen to um, real quick. Um, the Hilarious World of Depression is probably one I've shoved down everyone's throats about a billion times. Um, it's a really great podcast. It's funny. Um, they, you know, um, interview mostly comedians and creative people, writers and things like that. Um, the first episode was an interview with Peter Sagal and I was like, Peter Sagal isn't depressed. Um, turns out he is. <laughs> um, we're all really good at hiding it. And, and this podcast is actually something that helped me a lot whenever I was dealing with like the worst depression I've ever dealt with whenever I was living in Montana. Um, and then On Being by Krista Tippett, I think that's just a really wonderful book or a podcast to listen to, um, just to kind of, you know, uh, listen to how, you know, everyone deals with being a part of humanity. Um, and I, I finally, finally discovered um, When Things Fall Apart, which was a recommendation by Krista Tippett because she basically lives with that book. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I just started reading that and it's been really good to read during this whole quarantine thing. And I recommend doing that as well. If you haven't ever read that book. Um, I've been looking a lot at uh, uh, imagery of choreography and dance. Um, I really love how emotive uh, the body can be and how it can distort, especially when you're catching it in a still um, with a dancer. Um, obviously Bernini is a huge influence, um, the way he can depict flesh and <clears throat> strain in just like a hand, um, how that one little image there on the right can, can show so much and just, you know, just that grass. Um, Anders Krissar, um, is another one of my favorites at the moment. He, um, creates this really interesting work that almost like it forces you to look at that interaction between the two figures. Um, Jenny Morgan is another huge influence of mine. Um, her work is incredibly vulnerable and personal, um, but I feel like every piece that she's ever created, I can find a way to relate to it in some way. Um, and I kind of hope that my work can be like that for some people. Um, Emma Hopkins is another figurative painter that I think um, does a really great job of um, showing the core of the person. Um, Christina West is another huge influence of mine as far as scale and interaction between the viewer and the piece. Um, Camilla Taylor is a sculptor and printmaker that I'm really into checking out, or really into her work right now. Um, she kind of breaks the figure down into its parts to kind of, you know, get that point across. Kiki Smith, I'm trying to go really quickly through this part. Um, Beth Kavner, obviously a huge influence of mine. Um, she taught me a lot in the, the two years that I was at Studio 740. Um, and uh, basically changed everything I knew about sculpting. Um, so getting to like my more current work in the last, from the last three years. <coughs> when I was at Studio 740, Beth finally forced me to start sculpting solid where I was um, coil building everything before. Um, I was talking about the poster um, earlier and you can kind of you can see the poster to the left of that figure so um, distortions a little off but that poster is blown up to the same size as that sculpture and it was able to you can see some of those lines there draw on the the poster and find or um, to dictate where all of my armatures were 
So a little bit of hollowing that piece out so you can kind of see that process. <clears throat> Piper the Studio Cat loved getting inside the work while you're hollowing. <laughs> Um, like I said, I kind of, I try to work from like one into the other. Um, so here I was working from the toes inward. Um, I usually work from like the fingertips and the toes inward and the torso is usually the last bit that I, that I hollow on these larger pieces. Um, here you can see it fired in sections. Um, <clears throat> again, with all of those shrink slabs and supports inside the kiln, um, to keep her upright. If I were to fire her on her back, um, the possibility of that piece actually flattening out and that gesture and that curve of the body, I would have lost that. So I wanted to make sure I kept that um, exactly how I wanted it inside the kiln. Um, and then after the piece is um, fired, I put it back, all back together with PC11 and sculptural epoxies. And I could, t I could spend all day telling you how we were able to connect that knee, um, <laughs> but basically real, real short, um, I had to drill holes into the sides of the knees and twist wire to hold it together while the glue set um, and then fill those holes that I drilled into the piece with epoxy and PC11 so you can see that I actually did that at all. So that's that piece finished. Um, this was like one of the my first like um, solid pieces I ever made which was like insanely ambitious because it's about 40 inches tall um, and it weighs about 75 pounds. Um, in the end, I can carry it on my own. I, I'm really weird about making sure that I can carry my work on my own. So I usually don't make it much heavier than like 75 pounds because I can't really do much more than that. Um, but yeah, so with this piece, uh, I was probably going through like one of the hardest times in my life. My depression, depression was at like an all time high and um, like the color that this piece ended up being painted was actually the color of the sky around the time that I made it. It was like around, <clears throat> it was January, or no, no, wait, it was, it was early March in Montana. So the, the sky was just kind of gray and sad and I was gray and sad. And so it just all seemed very fitting um, to make this piece the way it was. Um, but the idea behind it was that she seems kind of that she's like in a struggle or, but like the look on her face and she seems a little relaxed. So it's kind of like that idea of it's sometimes easier to give up than to actually do the work to get help. Um, so my net, like my next ambitious piece while I was at Studio 740 was this like three quarters life size self portrait. So um, at this time I started kind of making, all of my work started looking like me and that was for a reason because it was all very self-referential and I'm my only available model. So I was like, screw it. Um, I'll take images of myself, I'll hide them from people who come into my studio. So I had them like up on this board that I could flip over like a sheet. So no one could actually see the images of me. <laughs> um, for some reason there is this like um, removal of like the nude figure when you're, yes, I'm sculpting myself, but it's not an image of myself. It's like my own rendition of myself. So it's not, I'm not really putting myself out there in that kind of way. Um, but you'll see like my studio starts to look a little bit like a Dex, like scene from Dexter. I was like, I have all these hacked up pieces um, lying around my studio in plastic bags. <laughs> so that's it. this is that piece finished. So um, a little bit of like this nod to being uh, medically examined, um, the uncomfortable feeling, you feel really vulnerable while you're laying there, um, but you try your best to lay still. So she's very still, but you can see a lot of that tension in the toes, the eyes, and the fingers. Um, that cast glaze section kind of worked as a, it was this kind of, um, kind of a, a thing that was kind of breaking up the harmony of a healthy body. Um, <laughs> this piece I created uh, around that time was probably at the tail end of, of my really hard stint with depression. I finally started getting help at this time but it was like the very end of it and things were starting to feel like they were never going to get better. And I was just longing for like what um, could, could be, uh, or what was the past um, and being happy. I know that I'm smiling in this photo, but at this time I was holding this piece because I was just like, all my friends are having babies and this is what I'm doing. <laughs> so there's that piece finished, Sadeje. Um, so like Sadeje is a Portuguese term for um melancholy and longing um for a better time um 
So I thought it was totally fitting for this piece. Um, again, you can see that poster behind the piece. It's that um, uh, block poster that I'm using to kind of base my um, proportions off of and things like that. And you can see I have all of those um, armatures marked inside or on the poster and on the piece. And then you'll see like the most elaborate shrink slab I've ever made. Um, I had to flip her over and build most of it on top of her back and then um, finish her off and add it to the slab. That way everything stayed where I wanted it to be and I didn't and it didn't shift in the kiln. So there's that finished finish piece. This piece um, actually just balanced on a metal rod that slid right into the head, um, which was really great. So this was kind of like a re, um, a redo of a piece that I made a year earlier because I had learned so much from working with Beth and making those two larger pieces that I thought I could redo it and I did and I'm much happier with this one. So after leaving Studio 740, I did a um, summer residency at the Archie Bray Foundation. Um, so these, this is uh, the piece that I made while I was there. I was hoping to make a lot more, um, but um, I don't know how many people that are joining us here have done a residency at the Bray, but um, in the summer, it can be really exhausting because you're being social and trying to make work at the same time. So it's really difficult for somebody who goes in with these ideas that you're going to make so much while you're there. And then um, you end up making one piece that was really like important to me. Um, but at the same time, like, I feel like I wish I, I wish I could have gotten done more done there, but it was a hectic summer. Um, <laughs> So anyways, with this piece, I eventually ended up removing all of those hands that were on it because it was starting to look a little too much like something from a horror movie. Um, again, you can see the shrink slabs here. Um, you can also see the, the shrinkage rate of my clay is very, very high. I use Soldate 60 for some of this larger stuff. It has a ton of grog in it, so it shrinks quite a bit. It's about a 15, 12-15% shrinkage rate. So oftentimes when you're making what you think is a large scale sculpture, it can come out of the kiln looking like a toddler. So you have to be <laughs> um, uh, aware of what you're doing with those things. So here's that piece finished. So this was right after I had um, like, you know, started seeing a therapist, started uh, a good medication regimen, started learning um, tools and, and tricks to, to kind of, you know, manage my anxiety and depression. So I felt like I was kind of coming up for air. Um, so that's kind of what this, this piece was about, especially with that, like the dark blue to the light blue. I wanted this kind of look as if she was coming from the depths. <coughs> so, um, once I finished my residency at the Archbury Foundation, I came here to the University of Oklahoma to teach. Um, and so I started kind of scaling down the size of my work because my workload had become a lot more hectic, um, finding that balance between working in the studio and, and, and teaching um, was kind of difficult at the beginning um, because I was so used to being a studio artist for, for almost three years. So um, I had to kind of readjust the way I did things. So I was making some smaller pieces. Um, this one was a sculpture I attempted out of porcelain, which will probably never happen again. <laughs> um, she went through some major cracking, but we were able to fix it. Um, so this piece is kind of this idea of, again, I'm dealing with like ideas of wanting to be a mother um, and uh, trying to figure out when in my life that might be appropriate or if I am ready for it. Um, and I'm reminded every day that I'm running out of time by my lovely mother and <laughs> um, many other people that like to say those things. But uh it's something that I think about a lot and I know that like I'm not the only female artist in the world that is dealing with this but I feel like I came to age at a time where I didn't have a lot of female mentors that had children so the I don't know the um the map or the I, I don't know I just feel like I like I've I've spent most of my life learning from other people of what to do in those situations and I don't have a lot of examples of that so it's kind of freaking me out a little bit. <laughs> um, trepidation, this piece was like I made it when I first started my job. It was kind of like like it's got a bit of a deer in headlights look. Um, that's kind of how I felt when I first started my position here. It was um, 
uh, a lot. Um, my colleague Stuart Asprey, um, who is the associate professor here, he was on sabbatical my first year here, so it was like I was like thrown into the deep end. Um, it was great in in the end, in retrospect, but at the time I was like, wow, ah, like this is crazy. Um, um, I was also like, you know, feeling out my coworkers a little bit, you know, fellow faculty members, like, do, are they psyched that I'm here? Are they, you know, feeling threatened by me or should I feel threatened by them? I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a strange world to be in. Um, this piece I made probably about a year ago, um, just kind of my feelings on the current political climate. <laughs> um, and I just also wanted to make something with extreme, extreme expression. So this was, um, this was uh, my attempt at that. Um, here's a real quick video of me spraying that piece so you can kind of see um, how that's done. I was talking with a friend um, about makeup application the other day and she was showing, she like sent me a video. She's like, have you ever thought about like how makeup and um, create shadow and things like that? And I was like, Hell yeah, I've been watching RuPaul's Drag Race since it began. Like, I pay attention to, to creating, like, the illusion of highlight and, and things like that. Oh, you don't want to see that again. Um, so this is the, the piece Covet um, that I just finished last year as well. Um, kind of this idea of, um, I am sure many people have felt this and probably don't want to talk about it as much, but, like, when you're in a career like this, you oftentimes see people getting the things that you want, or, um, you know, you, you apply to everything and then you see the same people getting certain things, or I don't know, it's just, you know, it's, this piece is mostly just about jealousy and, um, I don't know, kind of just being honest about that. Um, I'm extremely, I'm an extremely competitive person, so I just see life as a competition, <laughs> and, uh, and that's kind of like putting, I don't really show that part of myself very often, but I feel like it's okay to admit that like I can be a little shitty sometimes too. <laughs> and here's um, a quick like um, time lapse of hollowing that piece out. This is how I spent my New Year's Eve um, 2019. <laughs> All right, Oop. nope. Okay, so this is that uh, like four foot tall foot I was talking about um, earlier. So you can see a little bit of that hollowing process again. You'll see like these blue paper towels and a lot of things because they help keep um, the edges moist, um, but allows the rest of the sculpture to dry out a little bit and stiffen up. So I'm able to put things back together a little bit faster. This piece ended up actually turning out not um, as great as it looks sculpted in the first place. I had a lot of technical issues. Um, I fired, I, I had it in two halves and fired them in two different kilns, which was stupid because one kiln fired hotter than the other and so they didn't fit together as well um, as I hoped they would. Um, but I was able to um, make it work. Or the finished version of that one is. Um, um, in addition to that larger foot, I was also working on these smaller feet. Um, I was thinking a lot about this time about balance um, within my work life and my home life um, and balancing like my studio work with my teaching work and things like that and just finding my footing. Um, so this is kind of a, a literal way to address that balance, but I really feel like feet and hands can be so extremely expressive um, and I kind of want to break it down to just that and, um, and show like the tension, the pain, the um, almost like that grip um, that you can have on things with your feet. <laughs> so here's that larger piece balance. Um, you can see um, the bottom did not fire as hot as the top, so the proportions are a little off, but I kind of ran with it. Um, and I chose the color green because it's um, the color of greed, it's the color of success, it's the color of um, balance, it's the color of, it can be a good, it can be a good representation of something, but it can also be something very bad. So I just wanted to kind of um, play with like those, the two, the double meaning of, of, of what this color can represent. Um, I don't really talk much in my artist talk about my jewelry um, and functional stuff. I just kind of mention it. Um, 
so this this stuff has kind of taken off a little bit. Um, I didn't think it would be become what it is, and it's almost 100% of what I'm working on nowadays. Um, but I realized it's, at first it was more of something just funny and cute and like a side hustle. Um, but I'm realizing that the, the more I get into it, the more I get into like creating like uh, the female anatomy with vulva and penises and things like that. It's becoming more about like body positivity and self-expression and self-love, um, which wasn't my intention at first at all. But and, but it's also become made me a little, a little more open about like what I'm willing to talk about and what I'm willing to express. Um, but it's really nice to see the the effect that it's had um, and how people interpret the different things. And at first I thought I was gonna get a lot of flack for, for sculpting vulva and um, most recently a cup masturbating. <laughs> um, but it's actually become something really incredible because people really appreciate that I'm like normalizing this kind of thing. I don't think I am personally normalizing it, but um, that's my attempt is to say like, this is nothing to be ashamed of. We're all human our bodies are beautiful and should be explored. Um, so here's some more of that work as well. The mouth um, cups and bowls are, are my hot item at the moment. Um, so real quick, just some, some things talking about like, you know, where I've been, what I've done. Um, in Sika 2018 was a huge year. Um, we had the ceramic sculpture um, collective exhibition. Um, I did a um, demonstration in the demonstration room and also did a panel talk on um, mental illness and how it affects our um, social, our studio practice. So it was really exciting. I made a, like really good friends and really close relationships with the women that were also on the panel. Um, and it also made me realize that through my work, like I'm not just talking about my own healing and my own, my own depression and my own issues with um, uh, mental illness, but I'm also making this work to hopefully, um, you know, create a greater healing for other people. You know, um, one of my favorite favorite quotes is from um, Brene Brown. Um, she's a sociologist and psychologist. Uh, actually, I think works at the University of Texas Houston. Um, I could be wrong, um, but she says that um, empathy is communicating that incredible healing message that you're not alone. And I think that's what I want people to come away from my exhibitions with is like this feeling of empathy, not just for me, but for others. And um, she also talks about how there's three types of empathy um, within the world. And um, I, I, you know, I, I, that really resonates with me because you're thinking about like the cognitive, like cognitive em empathy would be, um, are they just simply understanding where this person is coming from? Are you just empathizing with just, you know, like, oh, that person's sad and depressed. Um, I feel for them, that kind of thing. Or is it more emotional? Like, does it make you reflect upon your own experience? Um, is it personal or is it compassionate? Like, is that, are you leaving with um, compassion and empathy? And I think that's where I'm at now is that it, the empathy that I feel for my students and other young people and maybe people who um, haven't felt comfortable to deal with their own mental health, I want to advocate for those people and let them know that they're not alone and that they can um, find help like I have and um, yeah, and, and be healthy and happy. Um, well, that's all guys. Thank you so much um, for everything. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Let me get this Zoom deal back up. Yeah, thank you so much. I've got a ton of questions. Um, that was really long, and I really apologize if we lost anybody. <laughs> no, I mean, it gets great to kind of hear about your work. So uh, for those of, like, if you turned in last week, the thing I find really kind of fascinating, um, last week we had Taylor Robino on here, and I feel like mm -hmm. you guys had a lot of similar issues that kind of overlap. Um, it's not even just, it's just, like, I find it fascinating how people tend to make artwork about things that they're generally, like, worried about kind of things that kind of scare them or even kind of things that, like I know my own works like the things I find humorous that are kind of terrifying to me and I think you make yeah. that is kind of look really I don't know like so I guess the question I really have is kind of like do you kind of think of your work as kind of like a way to work through some of your own personal issues of things that you're like dealing with in your own life oh absolutely um it's become 
like I people always say like oh like creative outlet it will make you feel better but it's no lie it's no joke like my work is my way of of dealing with things a lot of the times like so the two feet the the big piece that um well, it's not really that big um but it's large in this small space um the big the piece that i just showed you guys earlier the two feet um i was basically feeling like right after all this started i was feeling unmotivated by all the things that i had to do and that piece was basically this is what i fucking want to do right now <laughs> so i um decided to make it and again it's like that feeling of feeling like you're on the edge like like that like can you imagine like I had to actually I took images for that piece so I had my husband take pictures of me trying to balance myself like on the very edge of a corner it's near impossible <laughs> um so that's what I wanted to do is I wanted to create like this tension of like I mean it is impossible if you're just standing there it might be possible for some people but I'm not that strong um <laughs> But yeah, I, I, it's a lot of the work is is reflective of what I'm going through at the time. And I used to think that was like, I think it's growing up whenever, like in the early 2000s, like everything was so emotional, like emo music and things like that. <laughs> um, and I will admit I was an emo kid, <laughs> but I think it, it's, it's working out in my favor now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love hearing the stories behind the work i mean i've known you for i don't know how long now and i mean mm. i've seen i've known your works forever like i feel like we kind of like graduated from grad school and like i never really heard your kind of stories behind them i mean we spent yeah. three weeks together in montana and i never like we never really talked about the themes about the work so i really love and kind of enjoy hearing you talk about things and kind of really seeing that personal side of kind of your life i think mm -hmm. it i mean it's a huge it's hard to kind of talk about sometimes to kind of really open up and really be like this is what I'm vulnerable I see your work is very vulnerable kind of like what the issues you're talking about and you know I think that's awesome I really love the fact how I mean I think it's just funny how you and Taylor kind of really talk about a lot of the same issues within your work that you know mm -hmm. kind of fears of life in general you know I think that's great and I love kind of hearing more about that um, we do have we have put Two questions about the casting process that I could yeah. do here and have like a three hour conversation about it. <laughs> so, um, can you? So, are you using just plaster to cast in? So, is it just so yeah. like the molds you're taking is just kind of this plaster bandages and stuff and wrapping, and then that goes directly into the kiln with the glaze in it? Yeah. Um, give me one second. I'm going to plug my phone in so it doesn't die because it wore it out really quickly during that whole talk. One hot second. I don't want to like be in the middle of an answer and to like stop. <laughs> so yeah, to answer that question. Um, so the glaze casting process, it actually starts out. So I do, I use a plaster, like a manufactured plaster bandage. Um, I don't know if I have any handy right now. Um, oh shoot. So, um, yeah, I use a, I use a plaster bandage that, um, is pre-manufactured. Um, I actually got really lucky a number of years ago. <laughs> um, I ordered, um, two, I think it was like, I think it was 20 yards of plaster bandage and they sent me 200 and they kept doing it. And so I had like these 60 pound packages of plaster bandage rolls that are like you know huge sent, sent to my house and I still have some of that left and I think the last time I bought it was like four years ago I can't find it anymore so um that in the kiln is just completely fine when yeah it, yeah so like all the fiber that's in the bandage burns out and then any like so like the you know the chemical water like we talk about that in ceramics all the time like how it burns out in the kiln that happens with plaster too so what's bonding it together is no longer bonding it together after it's fired. So it just falls right off after you pull it out of the kiln. But it's strong enough to, you know, to hold the, the glaze and everything like that. But the reason why I put them in those sand crucibles is because once that chemical water does burn out of the plaster, it does fall apart in the kiln too. So if I don't have anything supporting it in the kiln, then the piece will potentially fall apart too. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like supporting everything, like holding it all together, kind of like, like metal casting, like 
um, if you're casting aluminum or iron um, and you're using a lost wax um, process with a ceramic shell, it's the same idea, basically. So you're breaking all of that off and like what's inside is your, your final piece. Yeah, I think I, I find that work fast. It's just so your work is so much different from the two. Well, you kind of have three veins of work that you really I know, want. I know. <laughs> I need to write like it in. Cat scheme, you have like the figures, which are like super well modeled. And then you have kind of that functional work. Um, I mean, I love the fact that I love seeing like figurative people make like functional sellable work. I feel like that's always. It's really thing. funny to see potters get pissed off whenever you start to sell more than they do. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a weird taboo thing that I feel like not enough people talk about as kind of trying mm -hmm. to, I mean, you said you made, you were kind of a studio artist for three years. Um, and making, being a sculptor in general is like a really hard way to do it. So it's kind of like trying to find a way to figure out how do you make it work? And I mean, you've mm -hmm. said it's kind of taken off to kind of, you know, be its own realm of things, which is great. Um, I mean, do you see a lot of that kind of influencing the bigger work you're making, kind of coming back yeah. to what you're doing? Yeah, I, I, I do. It's really weird because I'm, I'm also working with like two different, completely different clays when I'm doing that too. I'm working with finicky ass porcelain when I'm making my functional work and the smaller um, jewelry work. And I'm using like really groggy stoneware whenever I'm making larger stuff. Um, but yeah, they do kind of like, it ebbs and flows like how they kind of influence each other um but the one thing that i know that is constant between the two is like my obsession with mouths <laughs> um so like that all kind of plays together like i just did a series of just um eyes and mouths where i only let myself spend um what was it like i think 20 minutes on each small like piece and so I wasn't able to fuss over getting everything smooth like I always do. Like, I feel like, Travis, you probably have the same session I do, is, like, getting every little detail, like, perfect. So I'm trying to, t like, train myself to not do that. Like, because I really love where my work is whenever it's really rough and, like, like I just sculpted it and it's really fresh. But then there's something in me that goes back and like feels the need to like smooth the fuck out of everything. Sorry, I have a potty mouth if anybody's <laughs> offended by that. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, I think there's the overworking stuff is very easy to do. And I think a lot of people kind of have that tendency. I know I definitely, I'm way too obsessive about things. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, your work is so pristine and like smooth and, you know, it's not like a lot of tool marks left in your work besides the ones no. you want to go back in and add. So, yeah, and I'm trying. I'm I'm trying to. I'm not like saying it's wrong for me to be that way, but um, I don't know. I I want I want a little bit of that hand left in things. So I'm I'm trying to retrain myself basically. <laughs> like, I, mean, I love it how people that sculpt really refined work always want to work in the looser vein, but it's such a hard. Thing to do I think a lot of people you know you see that really like loose gestural work it's kind of all the like people dismiss it really quick I know I wish I could work that way but it's like so you know there's a like hard line between like too much and not enough yeah it's like that question that students always ask like when they do their like um, when they ask a, an artist all the, you know their their list of questions like how do you know when it's finished <laughs> you're like oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a difficult question i would like it to be finished like where it is now but will i allow myself to to do that we'll see yeah i mean i totally get that um so yeah i think we're gonna wrap it up cool. um definitely thank you for coming out it was great to hear about your yeah. work um it definitely if you have i know you might have some workshops coming up you can definitely if you want to plug those in be feel free to do that for those of you that are joining us, please join us for the next two Fridays, which we've got lined up. We've got Mark Arnold, who is a potter living in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And then the following week, we have Lindsay Ketterer-Gates, who is the director at Touchstone Center for Crafts, who also makes really wonderful work. I work with her all the time, and I'm so thrilled to actually hear her talk about her work. It's going to be glorious. Um, so definitely please tune in the next two Fridays as well. You can head to Touchstone Center for Crafts and kind of register for those as well. Um, and thank you all.
Well, big thanks to Jamie for coming out and talking to thanks, us. Thanks, everybody.